is uh, banal to point out that uh, this is an extraordinarily um, pregnant moment uh, in European security. Um, and uh, uh, I will start by, uh, by going back to when I first met Jody Jensen in 1989, and we worked together at the University of California, Berkeley, at a remarkable time, uh, the end of the Cold War, the fall of the, the, fall of the Berlin Wall, the re reunification of Germany, and uh, the end of the Cold War, and then the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so that was a dramatic a series of dramatic events. Um, which were frankly not anticipated to happen uh, or certainly happen as quickly as they did and uh, um, and raised the question of how would we, Americans and Europeans, Russians and everybody, manage European security in the future? In a way, it was a tabula rasa um, to the... Uh, in that the great enemy, the Soviet Union, collapsed, and that the great enemy uh, that uh, I had grown up with, and many of us of a certain age had grown up with, had disappeared, and a new government appeared in Russia uh, and in uh, the other 11 uh, new states, I exclude the Baltic states um, from this, uh, creating all kinds of new, opp new opportunities. Um, and the first, you know, George H.W. Bush, the president at the time, uh, his call was for a Europe whole and free, a Europe whole and free. Uh, later, um, Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin talked about a zone of cooperation uh, and peace from uh Vancouver to Vladivostok, kind of a clumsy formulation, but uh, uh, sort of a similar idea, uh, kind of expanding this Europe whole and free to the entire North Atlantic uh, region. Um, so let me read you something that Strobe Talbot wrote on January 7th, 1991, when he was a, uh, for Time magazine. Uh, the industrialized democracies must strengthen and broaden their existing economic, political, and security arrangements and develop new inclusive ones. NATO, still, which is still an anti-Soviet alliance, must give way to the CSCE, now OSCE, of course, with the Soviet Union and its spin-offs as members. That way, the future leaders in Moscow, Kiev, Vilnius, and Vladivostok will feel they are participating in and are beneficiaries of the Renaissance and the Commonwealth of which President Bush recently spoke at Wenceslas Square. Um, that was Strobe Talbot in uh, 1991, uh, articulating a very... Uh, a liberal idealist vision of a North Atlantic, uh, North Atlantic community. Uh, it is somewhat ironic that three years later, uh, he was a, the lead um, Russia guy in, the, in the, uh, the Clinton administration and the lead person charged with uh, moving forward with NATO expansion. Um, what, what happened? Well, first, I would say at that time, um, one thing I knew strong in my gut was that a Europe whole and free could never exist unless there was a place for it in which Russia felt comfortable and felt that its voice was heard and respected. And if Russia did not feel comfortable and did not feel that its voice was heard and respected, there would be a lot of trouble. Um, you know, maybe not so much in the 1990s when Russia was so weak, but uh, I regarded the 1990s as a, uh, in Russian history, as a smutnaya vremya, a time of troubles, uh, akin to uh, after Ivan the Terrible 
died and left no heir. And uh, uh, the state collapsed more or less in Moscow. The Poles invaded, etc. Also, uh, the uh, with the uh, uh, the collapse of the uh, Russian imperial um, government in uh, 1917, the Bolshevik takeover, the civil war, etc. Again, another time in which Russia's power and influence in the world was at an all-time low. Uh, and uh, I would compare the 90s to that kind of uh, situation for Russia. But I was confident that, uh, that some way, somehow, Russia would come back. Um, and it did. Now, what did we do with uh, European security architecture? Well, um, we basically relied on the existing institution, NATO, uh, to take the lead on this. There was some effort to uh, strengthen the, uh, what would be the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. But when it came to hard, um, hard security, uh, it was NATO. Um, and uh, the question of expansion came up quite rapidly. Uh, I think for several reasons. Well, one, there was the uh, uh, the crisis of the Yugoslav Wars of Succession, and NATO was the only institution uh, that seemed capable of addressing, uh, trying to address the uh, uh, the conflict uh, in the former Yugoslavia, and in doing so, that uh, NATO. Um, essentially changed from being a, a defensive alliance because it went out of area, out of area. Um, Yugoslavia was not a member of, of NATO. So that was a significant moment for NATO. Um, and then uh, what happened? Well, the Russian liberals, uh, Gaidar, etc., cetera, uh, they got beaten badly in the 1993 Duma election in December 1993. The uh, misnamed Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, headed by the uh, extreme nationalist slash fascist Vladimir Zhirinovsky, won the plurality of votes, and uh, and many were very concerned at that time of the emergence of sort of a brown-red coalition of communists and uh, and fascist nationalists coming coming together. That didn't quite happen, but Boris Yeltsin held on. Uh, but then, in a year later, uh, the Russians started the war in Chechnya, uh, and that was shocking, um, I think, for Russia's Russia's neighbors. And so, the the demand for the demand for NATO expansion, you know, it really came from the East uh, Central European states, the neighbors of Russia, who have experienced extremely traumatic history. Uh, not only with Soviet Russia, but also with uh, Imperial Russia. And we're looking to the West uh, for security. Um, I think the first goal actually was membership in the EU, but EU membership is much more complicated. And uh, NATO membership is relatively easier. And the, uh, and the Clinton administration uh, made the decision in 1994 to start moving along these lines. Now, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, to me, I think my view at the time was I was not uh, opposed to NATO expansion per se, but I thought that this was, uh, too hasty, um, in that, uh, it would affect uh, the Russians very, very poorly. And, um, uh, and I think make it harder to create the kind of Europe whole and free ultimately, that we wanted to, to achieve. Um, we, and we continued to tell the Russians through the first round of NATO expansion, the second round of NATO expansion, 1997 and 2004, that NATO is a defensive alliance, you have nothing to fear, Russia, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, frankly, to use a, a academic word, or phrase, I think that's just bullshit. <laughs> NATO is not a defensive alliance. 
I mean, it's, it is a defensive alliance, but it's not only a defensive alliance. I mean, ask the Serbs uh, who were bombed by NATO in 1999 how, whether they think that NATO is a defensive alliance. Let's talk to the Libyans uh, who were bombed uh, uh, in 2011 uh, in, in overreaching, I think, on the UN um, uh, approved no fly zone with the result, the death of Muammar Gaddafi uh, and regime change in, in Libya. Uh, I think that if you look at virtual, I mean, NATO bases have been used uh, consistently through the years, through the decades, for the projection of mainly U.S. power abroad into the greater Middle East, um, Africa, Afghanistan, et cetera. In fact, I actually, I, I would, I would be hard to come up with a time when NATO has been really used defensively. I mean, the only time that there was a call for Article 5 was, was uh, in, uh, <clears throat> after, in nine, after 9-11, the attacks on uh, the, uh, the World Trade Center and the Pentagon in the United States. So the Russians, as a continental power, naturally have a very territorial sense of security. And so this alliance, which was designed to contain Russia, uh, and is still designed to contain Russia, but not only, uh, is moving closer and closer to its borders. Uh, and Please note uh, that you have two more minutes. Are... Sorry to interrupt. Two more minutes. Okay. Well, I mean, why, how do we get to where we are today? The United States, in my view, overreached, um, you know, as the unipolar power, uh, not so much in the 1990s, but really, really, uh, uh, after 9/11, um, expanding the uh, the uh, the mission in Afghanistan, and of course the biggest uh, step of overreach was the war in Iraq. Um, but I could point to other other um, incidences, and I think they also overreached the Bush administration in pushing hard for uh, the um, membership action plans, the step leading to membership for Georgia and Ukraine in NATO in 2008. Uh, and Vladimir Putin said to George W. Bush in Bucharest that, um, you know, Ukraine is not a real country. Now, we could disagree with his view, but that's his view. And that was his way of putting a red line on Georgian and Ukrainian membership in NATO. And he demonstrated that, of course, with the five-day war later in August. So... Um, just to, I guess, to conclude, uh, what we see right now is, to me, this is the end of the period, this 32, 33 year period of efforts to make Europe whole and free. Uh, and we are entering a new phase uh, with what Mr. Putin appears to be doing. My view is that uh, we will have something along the lines of a new Iron Curtain that'll be either on the western border of Ukraine or it will be Ukraine uh, between west, west and east. Uh, and that the lines of security um, in, in international relations are gonna be much harder. And that we've already watched the Russian-Chinese relationship become much closer over the years. Uh, this is going to provide another uh, qualitative leap um, for that relationship, although Xi Jinping is not uh, that thrilled about uh, what Mr. Putin has done in violating the sovereignty of, of Ukraine. But this is the world that we're living in. And I think the key question really, and it is the topic of the conference, is where is Europe? Where, what is Europe going to do? Um, you know, I remember being at conferences in uh, the early 2000s and discussions about the European uh, Common Foreign and Defense Policy. Well, that went nowhere, nowhere. And uh, in my view, I mean, Europe has to take a more independent uh, uh, foreign and defense policy stance, um, I think, for this to be a, to, ironically, for this to be a safer, a safer world. Um, so I'll stop there.